Sometimes I will even do that in session. Because I'm trying to get the attention still. And couples are, are still at it. And I will I will I won't say anything. No, I will have to say try to grab their attention. Okay. Uh, 
Richard Jones Sr. Number three dies, and you give them this, the next son, the uh, middle name also Richard, do you think there's uh, more pressure on it? Yes, yes. <laughs> So then his nickname became Trouble, he is a troublemaker. Because he couldn't live up to a legacy that didn't that did not exist. So how do you think you might be in a marital relationship? He will struggle to meet expectations. Mm -hmm. okay. We're going to move on. <coughs> oh, now here's, here's where it comes to the idea. This is relationships. These are relationships that tell us information like the dots means that there is a, 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 the relationship is not close, there is separation. These lines, oh, sorry. These lines, double lines, means it's a very close relationship. And then double lines with a zigzag like this. Means close but conflictual. So more like moms and their sons. Or moms and their actually more moms and their daughters. Uh, just the zigzag means conflict. So we could say that does she have a close relationship to her father? Uh, okay. Does um, but good relationship with her mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah good relationship, her relationship with her aunt. Good relationship with her cousin. Good relationship with her mother. There's another one, I want you to see this. Uh, this relationship, is it good? No, 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 this one, the dogs. They're not close. His relationship with his father, dogs, 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 is that close or? No, it isn't. So what do you think her relationship with her future husband might be? It could be very fragile, it could be distance is connected. Initially they might be close, but in time it's going to be I'm going to die here. Okay. No, and then there's a conflict between the grandfather and his uh, mother. And let's look at Jason. He had conflict with his father. And he had conflict with, he was close, but also had conflict with his mother. So she had a very bad relationship with her. She had a bad uh, making of Oh, we don't know that. We just know that she had a bad relationship with him. So is it bad or is it not strong? Who's bad is it that? Alright, we don't know that's why I said we don't know that information. No, okay, no, okay. And these these double lines are strong relationship. This is a disconnected relationship. It's not a close relationship. Mm -hmm. And what she and Marie? She and Marie, uh, 
someone to be disconnected from him as per 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 She has what? She's close to, She's her, close to her mother, yes. Uh, yes, they don't, this doesn't show us anything about it. But next week, I'm going to actually uh, go through one of the, the theories. It says, we will marry the bad part of our, of our parents. Because we are in quest of a mythical mate. But today, this genogram, I use it with every one of my clients. Whether they're teenagers, young adults, adults, couples, families. The details will shift, but I will always do the structure. And I'm always looking for just three generations. That'll tell me many things, yes. Sometimes the coding heads makes the, like, there is a certain, like, uh, shows you certain patterns as well. Yes, oh yeah, this will show me pattern, but what, what it does is it looks into the generational processes. But I'm going to move forward. One last question, then I'm going to move. Do you, you do it in which session? Uh, either the first session or the second session. I will do the skeleton of it. This, I will do this one. This one in the first session or second? And time, if I need more information, I go back to it and I will do all these. I do it on a piece of paper with them, and, I, and then I show it to them, and we make corrections, we do adjustments. As I come from the belief that if somebody, especially when we're thinking emotion-focused therapy, it means that somebody up here has similar emotions to the client, and I look for who figured them out. So I might ask her to go interview her her aunt or her cousin, because they figured out how to uh, read emotions, process emotions, and it makes therapy more quick. Last question that I didn't need to move forward. Practice I used to uh, separate the genogram in the session and the relationship uh, diagram in other uh, assignment. It's preferred to be uh, uh, conjoined with the same uh, entity. Say it again. I'm sorry. I got distracted. Uh, no, no, you were fine. I just got distracted. Okay. Uh, in my practice, I separate the two assignments. Uh, assignment for the uh, genogram uh -huh. and another assignment for the uh, relationship uh, yeah, that's right. yeah. yeah, that's okay. I'm, I'm moving ahead, okay? When we have a break, you can ask more questions. So I, I established the relationship pattern, okay? the relationship process, that's the genogram. But now I'm going to dig in deeper to their relationship and how they're doing. And I want to ask them, what is the cycle? What is their, their negative cycles that they have? And I will first begin with, what was the most recent one? <laughs> Most recent, most, the one that happened just happened. And I become a detective. I ask, give me details. 
What did you, do you remember what you said? Do you remember your reactions to what you said? Do you remember your reactions to his reactions? Where were you at? Was it in the morning and in the afternoon? Was it in the evening? Was it a weekday or a weekend? Was it cold? Was it hot? So I'm looking for the whole context for it. <coughs> and I will even ask the question, how, how did you resolve it? Yeah, I do, I do. That's for, I begin with this one. Then I ask, what was the worst one? And there's usually one much, 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 much bigger one. And I, and I do all the questions again. And then I ask, when was the very first time? And I'm looking for what was the primary pattern. And then now I understand the cycle. And here's the cycle, some of the cycle process. It's the basic negative cycle. There's the pursue and withdraw. And I'm going to show a quick video.
Then there's some times where it's maybe not so obvious and we can get easily confused. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes those differences between pursuers and withdrawers can get blurred a little, especially maybe when you see a extroverted withdrawer. Mm -hmm. and And some people may think, oh, that's really a pursuer. So can you help us understand a little bit more about the differences? Sure, sure. I guess what I want to um, back up a bit and um, remind us why do we want to know? Why is it even important, right? What, what is our goal in this? And I think um, we are trying to get a sense of these interactional patterns, right? And we're mostly trying to understand what drives, right? What drives the um, shutting down or pulling away? What drives the pursuit and ang the anger or demand or criticism, right? What's, what's underneath that? What are the primary emotion, attachment related emotions that actually drive those behaviors? That is more important than deciding whether someone is a pursuer or someone is a withdrawer, right? Um, it helps us, it helps us make sense and put the positions of the cycle and have our little map that um, we, we like. Uh, but the real reason we're, we're tracking and trying to understand is because we do, we are trying to access the underlying emotions and attachment, uh, fears and needs to help people express them and be more vulnerable and own their experience and do something different, right? Right. So if we keep that in mind, um, we can explore, right, what we're paying attention to, who is protesting or pursuing for connection, right? We're beginning to hear um, in the demand or in the anger, in the criticism, there is an intention, the motivation of, I'm trying to get through. I'm trying to um, feel connected again. Or I'm protesting against the disconnect. Right? I don't want to be abandoned, that's sort of the typical pursuer. Maybe when you see a extroverted withdrawer, and mm -hmm. some people may think, oh, that's really a pursuer. So can you help us understand a little bit more about the difference? Sure, sure. I guess what I want to um, um, back up a bit and um, remind us why we are trying to get a sense of these interactional patterns, right? Shutting down or pulling away, what drives the pursuit of ang the anger or demand or criticism, 
right? What's what's underneath that? What are the primary emotion, attachment related of emotions that actually drive those behaviors? That is more important than deciding whether someone is a pursuer or someone is a withdrawer, right? Um, it helps us, it helps us make sense and put the positions on the cycle and have our little map that um, we, we like. Um, but the real reason we're, we're tracking and trying to understand is because we do, we are trying to access the underlying emotions and attachment uh, fears and needs to help people express them and be more vulnerable and own their experience and do something different. Um, 
that they will manipulate, like, that's your role, your role is to make me happy. Your role is to do whatever I want. And they will even use uh, scripture, they will use a multitude of things. And the wife will say yes, so physically she's present, but emotionally she's nowhere there. A withdrawal. This is the pursuer. Yes, that's the pursuer. That's the pursuer. Okay. The the withdrawer, their response is to help regulate emotional experience. They they need for the relationship to calm down. For them, emotions not not very not very high, not very low. And they won't show it. But they will tend to escalate the pursuer's effort to promote a with, an emotional response from the withdrawer. Yes. I can say that the pursuer has um, anxious uh, attachment and the goal is avoided attachment. More or less, not always. Not always. Because part of it is also personality. Okay, so temperament are also factors. They go into it. So, alright, so a moment of truth. Moment of truth. How many of you are pursuers? Okay. How many of you are withdrawers? Okay. Uh, by the way, typically the withdrawers would not uh, raise their hand. If you notice, like, oh, okay. it's not a like, According to the value of the relationship, according to the value, I, I, from my perspective, according to the value of the relationship to me. Sure? Yeah, sure. You, by the way, you can get a, a withdrawer to become a pursuer if you ignore them, or they feel ignored for a long time. But that's usually they're very frustrated at that point. Like if, when one of the interviews that I had this past week, the uh, person said, I, a uh, female, <coughs> she said to her husband, you have not, in, in the last two years, you have texted me three times, and both of them were the last year. I need some attention, some physical attention, because I am starving. So what do you think the husband did? That's your problem. <laughs> so they're divorced now. <laughs> so here are some key moments. Uh, this, is, this is processing. This is a focal point. <clears throat> you want to uh, listen to where the client's story or the narrative is interrupted by strong feelings or strong affect. Listen to the story. So in other words, where the emotion is very high, you got to listen to that. But also, but also you have to find out where emotion is missing. This means that you need to be paying careful attention to the story. And you must be aware of your own emotions. Your own process. 
I'm curious, how many of you have done personal therapy? Because this is an awareness that you need to do. And it'll make you a better clinician as well. Listen to personal landmarks. Listen to interactional landmarks. So personal landmarks is me. Like one personal landmark for me would be moving to Egypt. That's a personal landmark. An interactional landmark is also for me Egypt because I think my my family stayed in the, in the states and one outside of the another country. I didn't say Kama Amerikaya. And another one, in another country, my daughter is in Nepal at this very but she went, she moved to Australia. Uh, position markers. Like, what were your principles that you had at that point in time? Think of uh, when you were 20. Maybe 10 years ago. We were all 20, right? <laughs> 10 years ago. We had some principles that we believed in their 20s. Think of one that you shifted by the time you got into your 30s. You have it? What changed? Awareness. Awareness, okay. Age. Age, okay, yes. In a relationship, we shift all the time. And you also want to listen to positive contact. Like what? Our responses for okay. So um, I'm going to demonstrate. I don't know. The, when 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 I when I first met Christy, uh, we started dating, and in my family, we were not a very hugging family. So I have two younger sisters, and the first time that my family met Christy was over Thanksgiving. And it was time for us to leave to like our, our different universities. And so, um, it, uh, and so my sister said, "Oh, hi, Christy, we're all, all hugging." So they're all hugging Christy. And it was my turn. And so I, I come on a little closer. So. Um, so I was like, go, oh, go. No. <laughs> so I was like this. I'm like, oh, okay, Christy, bye. And my sister just laughed. I was like, that's it? That's the only thing you're going to do is hug her like that? So what's my response to this positive contact? No, no, I wasn't withdrawal. I was anxious. I had anxiety going in. But Christy's family is like, oh my gosh, and they're all hugging. And so this is an example, okay? This is a response to a positive contact or an interaction. So I tried it with many of you uh, yesterday, but I was here a little bit of today. What did, what did I do for positive contact? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was that was an activity. 
with me personally, with you. Introduce yourself. You love you, and share something about your life. That's okay. That's what I'm here. You came yesterday. Yes, I came for a while. You are yesterday. But yes, there it is. <laughs> the first thing that I almost always do is I smile to people. I would hang up. I'm with people. I, 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 because it just sort of it, it, it breaks the ice. Yes. Okay. And then I'll get a little bit closer and say, hi, my name is Heidi. Hello there. And I'll, and I'll start shaking hands. That way I have some contact. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will feel it go, oh, he doesn't want to be here. She doesn't want to be here. But, but when it comes to couples, you ask them, how, how do you interact? How do you, how do you greet each other? How do you engage? How does your family engage? Is it the same or is it different than you? And then I listen to, uh, this is still some other ones. Um, here, here I'm giving you some other ones, but I'm going to jump. After, oh, okay. So earlier he said when the affect is strong, listen to what is the emotional response to it. You want to also uh, give a message that is safe. Uh, and appropriate to share the experience in the session. So when it's, I think one of the hardest things that, that happens for couples is more the female than, than the male is when she has a miscarriage. <laughs> Can a male experience the same intensity of emotions as a female from this <laughs> No, but oftentimes I have heard men say something's wrong with her, that's why she had a miscarriage. Now, is that appropriate? No. no, it isn't. So, I am listening to, so my, my response to it is oftentimes I am so sorry. And if, and if the male says something derogatory, I often, if they say something's wrong with her, I will try, because there's an anger, and anger means usually they're hurt, I will say something to like, are you saying that you also felt the pain and you want to blame her? Could you please repeat it again, this, this sentence? Are you saying that you also felt the pain but don't know how to express it so you're blaming her? So I, I have taken this emotion, this reaction to her struggle uh, and that he's projecting and I've named it for him. Okay, any yes, yes. I'm there, they're, they're together with me. Because so, I remember as a we're, we're processing the emotions, we're trying to get to what is that for the primary and the secondary emotion. And sometimes I'm wrong, by the way. And I will say, so help me understand it, help us understand it better. What happens at that point is that he, the person feels, oh, he actually wants to understand how I'm feeling. And the woman will be quiet uh, because now she's realizing, okay, all his projected feelings really don't belong to me. They're his feelings. But now it's, it's an opening for discussion. And I if, uh, if the husband uh, persists, then he blames her. Do you focus with her? Then, or do you stay with him and try to like, uh, uncover his feelings? I, I will 
try to uncover it for a while. I won't. I won't last and, and to, to discover one uh, thing. I will. I will take it a step further and say, um, it seems to me as though you experienced a lot of disappointment in the past. So I take it away from her and I take it to his own historical thing. Yes. Uh, I see a lot with couples who blame is really there. Like, they don't know how to express their emotions. They always find a way to blame this happened because of her or this happened because of him. And, and, and sometimes they find it, especially with those who don't know how to express, to feel. This was my question. Is like, so the right way to go about it is to make them try to go back to their history and why is it like yes. Yep. Most of the time, if you can trace emotions to a historical point in their life, it can be, I always tell my students that between 8 and 12 years old, you're going to find a lot of the definitions for the person's emotions. And if you can trace it back enough, then you will find the root cause of what triggered that emotion in the first place and how it's acting out here in the present. Uh, but that, that's work. And then I will give them homework assignments to get to there. I don't know that I'm going to, if I ever do a model therapy, if we bring somebody, I can't understand, just too slowly. Oh, so, yes, yes. <laughs> whoops, sorry. So sometimes, the, when there's like, her example was lots of blame, I will help people trace back the history of the initial feelings that they had. Individual work. 
Because that's a style of living versus a relational issue. I uh, think the uh, the affect is gone. Then I'm also looking at what happened. What when did it start uh, leaving? I'm moving a little bit faster because I'm looking at my watch. It's like two o'clock. What time are we taking a break? Oh, it's like that. Three. Sorry. Can we take a short break now? Yes, we can. Are we ready, are we ready for a break? Yes, minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Yeah, ten minutes. All right, ten-minute break.